Kathy, and thank you for joining us on the YouTube live stream. We're so grateful and appreciative to have both author and adventurer David Roll here with us to discuss his works and his books and his life. And it's been um, amazing even speaking with him over the last few minutes talking about the things that he has had a chance to do and discover and even with his living in Spain and uh, lecturing and sharing the information that he has come across in the research that he's done. Uh, David, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us and your willingness to come on with us. Please, sir, if you would, share your website, contact information, where people can go to find and also support your work as far as your books and all that. Right. Well, first of all, Zen, thank you for having me on the show. It's very nice to speak to you. Um, I don't bother very much with websites, to be honest. I'm not that sort of person. But uh, all you need to do is just to type David Roll into uh, Google search, and you'll find probably about half a million pages of that various people have written about me and, uh, and things that I, I do. So that's probably the easiest way to get to know my work. Most excellent. Um, well, sir, can you give us a kind of general idea for the people that – may not know of you and may not have heard of the things that you do, your exploits, your books, and uh, a little bit about each one of them. Um, I know you said you have written nine now, and so even if you would like to sum up just a few or however you'd like to do that, but I think uh, people you know, would be interested in knowing. Right, of course. Um, well, first of all, I need to tell you that uh, I began work, as it were, on my research when I was about seven years old, which it seems a bit extraordinary. I was um, writing hieroglyphs at the age of seven, wow. the, the name, names of the kings of Egypt from First Dynasty through to the Thirtieth Dynasty, in hieroglyphs in Greek and in English, uh, the translations. I have no idea why I was doing that. It's just something that I did, and I have, still have the records of that, um, great big tomes of um, handwritten documents that I wrote at that age. And then I went to Egypt for the first time at the age of nine. Uh, I traveled uh, from Cairo all the way up to Abu Simbel in King Farouk's paddle steamer, his royal yacht equivalent. Um, and that was just after the, the war that they had there with the Suez Crisis. So it was the only ship or boat on the river and uh, King Farouk, Farouk had been kicked out of the country. And so we managed to commandeer his beautiful boat and we sailed all the way to Abu Simbel and I was uh, handed the great brass key that opens the doors of the temple, sent down the gangplank before dawn, and uh, was sent to open the door and go into the temple all on my own with the sun lighting my way as it rose on the eastern horizon, and wow. it was one hell of an experience. And that really got me fixed into Egyptology, and I've been in love with the subject all my life, and the ancient world as a whole. But then I was distracted uh, the, the, in my teen years, at the age of 16, and I went into the rock and roll industry. I had various bands, and uh, eventually I became uh, chief engineer at a recording studio, and then on from there to be a record producer. And that took about 25 years of my life. And then after I'd made lots of money and uh, decided to retire from that industry, I went back to university for the second time to study Egyptology and ancient history. And, uh, and that took me on to TV presenting and, and writing books, uh, best-selling books. And so I've had quite a varied career over the time. And in that period, I've also done a lot of exploring. I've been all over the ancient world. I've been to ancient Persia, Iran seven times exploring that region. Uh, I've been to all the areas of the Levant, including Syria and Phoenicia, Israel and Palestine, and of course Egypt uh, and the Sinai Peninsula. So I've done a lot of traveling and I've studied a lot of ancient world subjects, including the Greek world, the Anatolian or Turkish world, we would call it, um, and of course the Bible in relationship to ancient Egypt. So I've got a fairly broad uh, spectrum of knowledge on those subjects. Well, as I said previously, you most certainly lived a charmed life and like the real life Indiana Jones experience. And I know that people all over the world <clears throat> are, including myself, just uh, really envious of your exploits and the fact that you've had a chance to visit and interact with and experience all of these incredible places and we know now um, that there are so many all over the world scattered in 
and that megalithic structures, cyclopean architecture, mm -hmm. that these kind of things exist all over the world and they represent a lost era, a time, what the Egyptians called Zep Tepe the first times. That's correct, yes. When the, when the, whether it's the fallen angels or the demigods, people call them the extraterrestrials, ancient aliens, that whatever that these beings seem to have been here and interacting with the even pre-Adamic races here on this uh, earth and that even the fact that these kind of places exist at the bottoms of the oceans and had to have been constructed like Yanaguni and Dwarka and different places, one that was discovered here in Cuba, shows to us that there is an ancient uh, lost era of history that people do not understand and that science is not taken into consideration. Can you speak on that? Well, you have to remember that basically I define myself as a dirt archaeologist and ancient historian, so I tend to work within the standard disciplines at university. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the, the the Septepi period or the prehistoric periods. I'm not an expert in that. In fact, I would probably be more interested in talking to you and learning from you as to what your thoughts are on these things. But when it comes to documented history, that's where I can step in because I see prehistory as pre-writing. And if we don't have any writing that tells us what was happening in the prehistoric era, then we rely on anthropology and archaeology, and they're the two basic tools we have. When it comes to documented history, of course, we have sources. We have written sources which we can use, including the Bible, of course. The Bible is one of the major sources for ancient history. So when, when we're looking at stuff like uh, Gebekli Tepe, when we're looking at stuff like Atlantis and the legends of Atlantis, where I have to look at those from a, a, a source or a, a perspective that we get from the classical writings. So, for instance, Solon, who was the original one who brought the story of Atlantis. Um, uh, I wrote an introduction to Andrew Collins's book on Atlantis at one point, and uh, I looked at the, the theories of whether or not the origins of the story of Atlantis were based on the interrelationship between Athens and Crete and the Minoan civilizations, which I think there are some borrowings from, but they didn't mm -hmm. explain everything about that story. For instance, the Sargassan Sea is mentioned as being a place that you have to cross to get to Atlantis, and we know where that is. In fact, it's been in the news recently as being, it's actually growing now. We have the weeds growing in the Atlantic Ocean now, which are expanded on a dramatic level in recent, recent years. So we know there is some connection to the area around Cuba and in the, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but what it is um, and and what we can do with it is very hard to determine because we don't have any written sources for it until mm. the classical period, until the time of Solon and Plato. Yes. Yeah, there are new uh, stories that are coming to light, like the Colburn Bible, which was released in 2006. There's a scroll as part of that narrative called the Scroll of Dothis, uh, which you might... Um, be interested in reading it's a uh, I think it's connected to the old Atlantean mythology and provides some insight into that story but um, with regard to what you have examined what you have studied what you have learned from actually digging in the dirt and looking at the the uh, whatever it is that you have been examining can you mm. tell us of what you have learned and the stories that um, have come to light in your archaeology and uh, the study of you know the ancient cultures and civilizations sure sure well, it has to start from the point of view of my Egyptian uh, research Egyptology research when I was um, in the 1980s I was very interested in the chronology of ancient Egypt and uh, that's one of the reasons why I left the music industry to actually go into university again and to study and get the tools uh, required to be able to research properly you do that at university they train you how Sorry? Are you still there? Oh, yeah, sorry, brother. Um, it's all right. So um, I went back to university and I got those tools of, of being able to research correctly using sources properly. And, and it's from that that I realized that there was a problem with Egyptian chronology. Uh, we'd, uh, scholars had overstretched it backwards in time uh, too far by about three centuries. 
And, and that led me to a, a conclusion that I wasn't expecting to find originally. It wasn't my intention to look at it. And that was the relationship between Egypt and the Bible, because there was um, clearly no relationship. I mean, you know, archaeologists were denying the, the stories of the biblical um, text uh, because they said there was no archaeological evidence for those stories. That was because they were basically looking for the stories in the wrong time period because of their the way they constructed ancient Egypt. There was where the fault was. So when I started to look at the biblical story, I found that there were many elements of that story which we could trace in archaeology in ancient Egypt once we'd recorrected the timeline. And that, of course, then look, I looked at all the way back to Exodus. I was looking at the stories of Solomon and David, and I went all the way back to Moses and the conquest of the Promised Land with Joshua, and then even further back to Joseph and his time in Egypt with his father Jacob. And all those things seemed to piece together very nicely. And that was what I wrote in my first book, which was called A Test of Time. Uh, it was called Pharaohs and Kings in, in America. It's a separate, uh, separate title there. And there was a three-part TV series on it called Pharaohs and Kings as well. And that created a sensation around the world when it was shown. Um, people, it was very, very popular amongst the ordinary people, but of course academia went bananas. Uh, because I decided, first of all, that I was challenging the, the god of Egyptian chronology, which, you know, nobody dare touch that, it's cast in stone. Mm -hmm. and, and secondly, I was arguing that the Bible was historically based, that it wasn't a fiction, it wasn't a pious myth. Absolutely. There was much more than a pious myth. And so, and then I dared, well, it was logical for me, I said, well, what about the earlier periods? What about before the, the patriarchs? What about when we go back to the flood and the Tower of Babel, you call Babel? Uh, what about going back to Adam? Uh, what was going on in that period? Where would we look for those stories and those traditions? How would we relate it to what we know about anthropology and archaeology? And so I went on into that period, which is much more dicey, really, because there's no texts. As I said, it's, it's prehistory. It's not mm -hmm. textually based. But of course, we have the traditions. We have the Genesis traditions, and we have the, the Neo-Babylonian traditions. We have the Sumerian traditions of the Great Flood. We have three different flood heroes from three different eras of, of texts. So we have a lot of material that was enough to go back and look into that. But it, it, it was much more difficult to do because we are dealing with an era of so many unknowns. And so I thought, well, OK. If I, if I don't know much about it, what should I do? And I decided the only thing I could do was to go there. So I went off to what we call Mesopotamia. Uh, southwestern Iran was where I actually ended up. And I ended up traveling up through the Zagros Mountains into the area where we, can, we believe that the Eden stories originated. Um, the locations, the geography, the rivers, the mountains, the, the, the culture, the pottery, the... The, the agriculture development, the, the, the Neolithic um, revolution, all those things were going on in the area which we call today northwest Iran, uh, north of the Zagros Mountains. So we're on that sort of area between border of, of Turkey and the western border of Iran is where we're looking. And a lot of the material fitted together with that area, that topography. And so I was able to at least, if I couldn't prove that, this, that Adam and Eve existed, what I could do is prove that the location upon which the stories were based does exist today and still exists. Absolutely. And um, I agree with you that the Bible is a, a history book and a chronology of what has taken back uh, and gone back to what seems to be the modern era of modern humanity and um, and the stories of what has happened since that time. Uh, yes, again, there is this uh, missing episode previous to this called the Zeptepe era or the prior times as the yeah. Sumerians um, reference it. But in your work and looking at examining these ancient texts, d did you... And are you able to um, decipher and to read the language in its original context? Um, are you a linguist as well as a explorer archaeologist? My my linguist, linguistic skills were well honed when I was at university, but as I got older, they're much more difficult. Unless you're staying at university and constantly working with the hieroglyphs and the Hebrew, it's 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 sort of thing. It's a little bit like weight building, you know, muscle building. If you don't yeah. keep it up, you get flabby after a few years, yeah, yeah. and that's what's happened with me. Um, although I do have a number of scholars who I rely on to do the difficulties of looking at the Hebrew text in detail, and and some of these are expert Orthodox rabbis who specialize in this material. So uh, I have friends who and, and uh, colleagues who work on these things with me. But on the other hand, you see, there are 
if you're talking about the, the Mesopotamian pre-culture or the, the culture, pre-Sumerian culture that in, in the period that the Egyptians referred to as Septepi, then you're dealing with a language which originates before the Sumerian language comes into the region. So we have, for instance, the names of, of rivers, agricultural tools, mountains, etc., which are in a language which is pre-Sumerian. And that would be the language of the pre-Babel, pre-Babel era. And uh, that is the, because those are the types of things that people retain those types of words for. So, for instance, the word for hoe, the word for field, the word for river, those things are very ancient and, and they're retained in the language all the way through. So mm -hmm. we have these pre-Sumerian words which tell us there was a language in that region which predates the Sumerians right. and certainly pre predates the Akkadians. Um, since you brought this, uh, this particular issue up, I wanted to ask you if you had heard of uh, the work of Dr. Stephen Guide. He wrote recently a three-book set called The Thracian Script Decoded. And he, um, he and his brother, uh, Stephen Gardeski, they worked together to basically translate what seemed to be um, just rubbish and scripts and markings and they thought it was just all artistic on what are some of the oldest artifacts in the world um, been dated back to 7,000 years and uh, Godarski or uh, I forget the exact name uh, in what is the area of modern Bulgaria uh, the right. ancient Thracian uh, peoples that had lived there and the, it said that these artifacts and also that the script that is written on them uh, predates the Sumerian by 1500 to 2000 years and that this language now being decoded it shows the, an involvement that it turned out and came to be what is now the ancient hieroglyphic system of the Egyptians but again it predates them and predates the Sumerian and I was just wondering if you had heard about and if you have any comment on uh, that particular work and what you think what it might mean um, because these people supposedly were Christians as well um, and that they were the sons of Japheth and that right. they were believers in Yahushua I'm not familiar with the particular work but I have some insight uh, with working to a colleague in Germany who has just um, made a reed ship in that region and on the Danube and has sailed it from there, um, an ancient reed ship, it's exactly the same d design that we find in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, and sailed it through the Black Sea, through the Bosphorus, and out to Troy and beyond, to the islands of Santorini, for instance. He sailed it all the way there with his team to demonstrate the fact that peoples could migrate to the islands of the Mediterranean and to the coastal Mediterranean area from the Danube River and from that region. And uh, one of the reasons he did that was because uh, there is obvious archaeological evidence in that region for metalworking and smelting, mm -hmm. mining of metals. Now, the one of the great mysteries that we've always had is where did the Egyptians get their iron from and and their and their tin, etc. And one of the difficulties has always been not being able to locate the source for that. The Egyptians have plenty of. Um, uh, precious metals like gold for instance but they don't have the core ingredients to make bronze they have certain I think there's some elements of copper there but we find copper in all over the place but of course the tin has always been a great problem because tin represents 10% of bronze when you actually make bronze 10% is uh, tin and 90% is copper and so there was this question of to where the Egyptians got their materials from um, and uh, of course in the Great Pyramid in the in the in the burial chamber of the king we have a uh, residue of iron on the ceiling where there were actually large metal clamps which which were used to transport the main granite blocks to actually roof the the burial chamber and to transport them and to lift them and and the residue of the gold clamp sorry the 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 iron clamps which were there has been sampled and it is in fact iron so we have iron in the old kingdom which is of course way 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 before the iron age that's in the early bronze age so there's interest there and and the source seems to be from the area you're talking about so there certainly was some sort of contact uh, 
from, I would say, the northern Black Sea area, the areas north of the Black Sea, through to the e Egyptian Delta. And uh, whether or not you include Mesopotamia into that uh, to make a triangle of trade is another matter. But uh, we almost certainly can say there was trade from the Black Sea area down to the Mediterranean. Fascinating. That's a really fascinating. Um, wanted to ask you, because you had mentioned previously about the the reason why Egyptologists and those that have held on to a particular timeline for the occurrence of history have missed the interactions with the Hebrew people and Egypt because we know that in the historical narrative of the Bible that they were there from the time of Joseph until the time of the coming of Moshe and sure. it was then that they were freed in the Exodus to then go forth and inherit the promised land that the Canaanites had taken from them um, mm -hmm. uh, and that the promise to Abraham was to, to reclaim that land. And so can you tell us what what is missing there and how it was that your work was able to rediscover these connections and to affirm this interaction? Okay, well, we have to deal with two areas here, the, the, and they're, they're basically quite complicated, especially the second one. The first one is that if we look at the first chapter of, of Exodus, we read that the Israelite slaves built a city called Ramses, now, and another city called Pithom. Well, Ramses has obviously, for the last several hundred years, been associated with King Ramesses II. And so everybody has assumed within Egyptology and ancient history that the, the city was being built in the time of Ramesses II. So, which is fair enough. I mean, that's a logical conclusion to draw. Now, what they did then was they said, okay, this must be when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt because they, they built this city called Ramses for Ramesses II. So that's why we really pinned the Exodus date to that reign. Now, there's a second biblical link, which has been a, a, a major mistake in understanding how the relationship between Israel and Egypt works, and that is the identification of another pharaoh called Shishak in the Bible. Now, Shishak is uh, a, the king who plundered the Temple of Solomon in the fifth year of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So, five years after Solomon died, an Egyptian pharaoh called Shishak comes along, he plunders the temple, he takes the, the gold out of the temple, the golden shields out of the palace, etc., and takes it all back to Egypt. And, and some people argue the Ark of the Covenant, etc., but that's not in the biblical story. Um, and the, the thing is that what people did was, in fact, it was Champollion, the great decipher of Egyptian hieroglyphs, who, who brought this to, to the fore because he went to Egypt having deciphered the hieroglyphs and found an inscription of a pharaoh called King Shoshank on the walls of Karnak and there he saw what he read was the kingdom of Judah in the campaign list of all the places that this pharaoh had conquered. Now unfortunately because the, the, we were in the infancy of understanding how ancient hieroglyphs worked, he mistranslated it. The term is actually Yad Hamelech, which means the hand of the king. He, he, he read it as Yehuda Hamalkuth, which means the kingdom of Judah. And so he linked this Pharaoh Shoshank with a story in the Bible about Pharaoh Shishak plundering the Temple of Solomon. And that key synchronism has held up this l l extended version of uh, Egyptian history, if you like, because the synchronism has been a tie which had been locked in. And if you then work backwards to, to, through the Egyptian king list to get back to Ramesses II from Pharaoh Shoshank, who was the founder of the 22nd dynasty, Ramesses II is the, uh, the third king of the 19th dynasty, so you work backwards, counting all the regnal dates back to Ramesses II, you get a date of around 1250 BC that you get for the, the Exodus date. Now, you know and I know that the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that we're talking to roughly 1450 BC for at the time of Moses and the Exodus. So the Bible and, and the, the Egyptian data system do not work. So when we look at the evidence at the time of 1250 BC, the time of Ramesses II for Moses and the enslavement of the Israelites and all those things, and then we look at um, we look into Israel, the promised land at Jericho, there is no Jericho at 1250 BC. It's been a ruin for hundreds of years. It didn't exist in that time. And the same can go for many of the other sites that Joshua conquered. So when you look at the thing, the thing doesn't work. So we have a tremendous circular argument here. We start with the idea that Egyptians or the Egyptologists date Egyptian history via a biblical synchronism, which is clearly not correct. Mm 
you don't do that. The methodology you use is you use the Egyptian eternal evidence to date your Egyptian evidence, and then you look for evidence to link with the Bible. But what they did is they used the Bible to date Egyptian history, then they used the connection with Ramesses II and the building of the city of Ramses to date Moses, and then when they look for archaeological evidence, they say there is none. So the whole thing must be a myth. The Bible must be a myth. Moses never existed. Uh, Jericho never existed when Joshua conquered it. And so the whole thing is a fable. And that's where the problem lies. And I know that's complicated, but basically what you've got is Egyptologists using the Bible to date Egyptian history and using Egyptian history to dismiss the Bible as a myth. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you think that in the, the work of Egyptologists and archaeologists that there's, um, I don't know, a mindset to, to try to dismiss? Is there some kind of weirdness going on there um, with trying to discredit the Bible that you know of? I wouldn't say that because the the original um, impetus for Egyptology was in fact to discover evidence for the Bible in Egypt. The first archaeologists who went to Egypt were looking for the biblical story there. So I wouldn't say that, but what I would say is that they've created a holy cow. In other words, the the Egyptian chronology and timelines have become so sacred to them that they daren't think about changing mm -hmm. it, dismantling it, and restarting again. It's almost like a religion uh, in the sense that, uh, right. you know, everything, they must be right. Everything must be right. We can't revise or rethink the thing. We can't reinterpret the evidence in a different way. We can't use a different method. We can't dismiss that biblical link. It's got to be correct. And therefore, you know, anything I suggest where I would suggest that that link is in fact it's, it's fictitious. It doesn't exist between Shishak and Shoshak. It's made up by scholars over the last 200 years mm. um, that we, we can relook at the thing. And when you do relook at the thing, you find there's much, much better evidence for linking the biblical story with the Egyptian material. In your knowledge, do you know of any uh, work or any discoveries that have come forth that show the era of Joseph? in in Egypt or if Big, they called him I'm sure they called him by a different name or well no we have we found big evidence massive evidence when we get the timeline uh, of Egypt sorted out <clears throat> and we look back to the era of of Moses and we project back further to the time of Joseph we find in the eastern delta underneath the city of Ramses, so another city lies underneath it, a city called Avaris, which is one of the biggest cities in the ancient world. It had over 30,000 people living in it. In the eastern delta, which is the land of Goshen that the Bible describes. So if we go back early enough, we find the beginnings of this, this massive city in a small village, maybe 70 to 100 people living in a dozen houses or so, maybe two dozen houses. And in, and in the middle of it, we find a, a house that's built in the style that you would find in Haran, in northern Syria, which is where, of course, Abraham came from, that region up there. So the, the building architecture is very similar to what we find in that region. It's called, a, in, by the Germans, a Mittelsaal house or a middle room house, and it's, it's typical of that area. So it's quite clear that the people who came and started that town, that little village in the eastern delta land of Goshen, were Semites. They were coming from that mm -hmm. region. And that's quite clear from their graves as well, because we find uh, Canaanite-style pottery in there. We find Bronze Age daggers that come from that region as well. The culture that came into the eastern delta was Semitic. And so we have these beginnings there. Now, I've uh, understood that this house probably is the house of Jacob. So that when he came down into Egypt, he he had a house built for him that was in the style that he was, uh, that his people were accustomed to. Now, admittedly, they lived in tents for for quite a bit of time, having moved down from the region of Haran. But they would have been familiar with the style of architecture that was in northern Mesopotamia, where the patriarchs came from. And and then when this this house was demolished because the owner of that house had died, and that was the tradition in ancient Egypt, they demolished the houses. On top of it was built an Egyptian palace, a beautiful palace. Now, that palace, we know from the material culture in the graveyard that was associated with the palace, was also Semitic. So these people were descended from the person who lived in that Mittelsal house, or that Syrian house. And the facade of the building, the, the original facade of the building, had 12 columns in front of it. So we, I thought that was quite mm, interesting. Fascinating. And then we, when we, 
And then when we looked at the graveyard at the back in the, in the garden behind the palace, we found 12 main tombs. So that's, I thought that triggered interest in me. You know, okay, we've got 12 sons of Jacob, we've got 12 tribes, we've got 12 columns on this palace, we've got 12 main tombs. Right. And, then, and then one of those tombs turned out to be a pyramid tomb. Now that is that for an Egyptologist was really freaky, because we know that the people who had pyramids built were kings and their queens. Right. Uh, people who were not royal did not have pyramids built for them. But the archaeologists, the Austrian archaeologists who were excavating the site, when they dug down below the pyramid where the burial chamber was under the ground, they found a chamber made of mud brick with a domed uh, sort of um, roof, and inside that chamber. There was nothing. There was no bones. There was no coffin. There was no pottery. There was no mummy beads. Absolutely nothing. And when they looked more carefully, they found that, that there was a robber's tunnel coming from outside the pyramid. In fact, in what we call a chapel, a funerary chapel in front of the pyramid, there was a tunnel that had been dug down into the tomb and everything in that tomb had been removed. So the Egyptologists, oh, it's tomb robbery. And it had happened in ancient times, by the way, this, this removal. Yeah. But I said to them, no, 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 no. What, what tomb robber would steal bones? You know, you right. don't take bones out of a... What value do bones have uh, if you remove them? So this was nothing to do with tomb robbery. This was a pious removal of the body wow. and everything that was in the burial chamber. And then in the, the chapel in front of the pyramid, they found fragments of a colossal statue twice life size. And when they pieced together the bits they could find, it turned out to be of a Semite with yellow skin and red hair. The paint was still on the, on the statue. And the coat that he was wearing was a multicolored coat. Oh, so wow. It, of, of, of stripes, colored stripes. Okay. <laughs> and, and the statue's face had been smashed. The nose had been broken off. The mouth had been broken off. Their eyes had been gouged out. Somebody had tried to hack it to pieces with an axe. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought to myself, what on earth is this about? But when you take that story to the book of Genesis and you learn the story of Joseph, who was yes. rewarded by Pharaoh for being this great genius who saved Egypt from the terrible famine, right. of course, he would be retiring in the land of Goshen where his family was. Yes. And he would have a palace and a tomb there, which is what we find. And lo and behold, there's a funerary statue of a man in a multicolor coat, a coat of many colors, with yellow skin and red hair. And when you look in the tomb, there's no body. And that's wow. the story of Joseph having the body, Moses removing the body of Joseph out of there at yes. the time of Exodus and burying him in Shechem once mm -hmm. they reached the Promised Land. Yes. So it was a beautiful match between wow. the archaeology and the biblical story. And it really is fabulous. Yes, that's an um, amazing tale. And for those that don't know exactly what we're talking about with regard to the promise uh joseph encouraged his sons and his uh descendants that once because they knew in prophecy that they would be enslaved there for 430 years even abraham was shown in vision and given this prophecy and so he made them promise to take his bones out of that land out of Egypt and to what would be their return to the promised land. And so this story is found interwoven into books like the Aramaic Targum, the Legends of the Jews, uh, the Chronicles of Jeremiel, uh, the Perkti Rabbi Eleazar, different confirming witness to what David now has shown us uh, at the ground level uh, in confirmation of his work. It's what a beautiful and amazing, incredible story. And I thank you so much, sir, for sharing that with us. Because um, I have never heard anybody tell it or mention it. And then, of course, the robe of many colors. Um, certainly, I'm writing a book now called The Garments of Power and the Rod of Wonder. And it talks about the specific uh, vestures that were given to Adam when he was removed from paradise and this sapphire staff that he was given from the tree of life and it was this staff that Moshe inherited um, and that um, Joseph the, the garment the robe of many colors was this particular garment of power and so there's a whole history of these items all throughout the biblical narrative and so that story that you shared with us is
part of that uh, rich history. It's true, and, and in fact, it's obvious that clothing was a status symbol. So, for instance, the fact that Jacob gave one of his younger sons the, the robe was what made the rest of the elder brothers very jealous of him because it was yes. an acclamation of him as a leader. And so pe people might be saying, well, hang on a minute. Uh, we know that the, the robe that Jacob gave him was torn asunder and, and, and covered in blood uh, when the brothers went to say that poor old uh, Joseph had been killed by a, a mountain lion or a wild beast. And that was the story they gave to the, their father. Mm -hmm. Jacob so um, he can't be wearing that in Egypt well of course he can because he would have had a new robes made when he became the, the vizier of Egypt he was a high status individual he would have high status clothing and what he would do he would choose the coloring and style of his people he, he would dress like an Egyptian when he was in the Egyptian court but when he was living in the land of Goshen with these people with his des the descendants of Jacob he would have dressed in the in the Israelite way in the Hebrew way yes. and so that's why he would have a you know it was his symbol. The thing we know most about Joseph is his coat. The multicolored coat was the thing that we all remember about the story, you know. So we've even got rock operas written about it. So uh, that was the symbol and that was the thing that he would wear on his funerary statue. And don't forget he was highly Egyptianized because he lived in Egypt for all that period of time and he lived within the Pharaonic court. So he would have ad adapted some of the things like a funeral statue, which probably, you know, Abraham would have, would have abhorred. He would not have approved of that. But, you know, because Joseph was Egyptianized, he had an Egyptian stand style pyramid tomb with a, with a mortuary cult in it and therefore a, a funerary statue. So that's perfectly understandable, I would think. Yes, and there's also a connection to the end of days because uh, in following the story of the garments of power and the rod of wonder, it's connected also to the return of Messiah. And there's a passage in the King James, uh, Revelation 19.13, that says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. It's my uh -huh. opinion that this vesture dipped in blood is the very same one that Joseph's brothers had in mm -hmm. spilling the blood of the kid and showing it ripped up and giving it to his father as a sign that he had been killed by these wild animals, that this will be the same thing that Yeshua will return in. Because the garments of power go all the way from Adam to the Messiah who came into the flesh to redeem them and to rectify the fall. And so just a full circle kind of story. And, uh, well, that uh, makes absolute sense to me. Um, but what you mentioned something a little bit earlier on, I think we should develop a little bit, was you said, well, maybe we don't know the Egyptian name of Joseph. Um, but we do, of course, because the Bible tells us what it is. Zaphanath Pa'ania is what the Bible says Pharaoh called Joseph. Now, that's interesting because if we have a biblical reference to an Egyptian name for Joseph, can mm -hmm. we find that name in the Egyptian records? And can we find a vizier, uh, the chancellor, if you like, the person who was ruling the country under for Pharaoh in this era when we've got this pyramid tomb and the palace and all the rest of it, and what we call the, the late Middle Kingdom is when this is all going on now. And in fact, we do, because we can decipher that name and turn it into ancient Egyptian. It's a, it's a sort of semi-garbled version, the biblical one, Zaphenath Paania. There's something called metathesis going on. What happens there is that two consonants are reversed because the, it's, it's a foreign word. And if you're not familiar with it, sometimes you can turn the consonants around and, and, and it changes it slightly, makes it a little bit garbled. But uh, Zaphenath is actually in Egyptian Zatinaf. So the, the, the F and the T have been reversed or been, uh, you know, so they've been swapped over. Zatanaf in the ancient Egyptian means he who is called. Now, we have ancient slave lists from this period of Semites who have been given Egyptian names. So in each case, they're given their Hebrew name. Then it says he who is called and then they're given their Egyptian name. So it's X who is called Y. Now, if that is what we've got here with the name Zafenath Pa'anea, then the second half of that name, after Zatenath, is Pa'anea. And Pa'anea must be the name that the Pharaoh gave to Joseph. Now, that is straight Egyptian. Pa'anea means the, the, the one who lives. The, the, the Anea is the way that the Egyptians pronounce what we call today Ankh, A-N-K-H, the sign of life. So it means the one who lives. Now, just imagine the story of, of Jacob coming down into Egypt, 
and he, he's confronted by the son that he thought was dead, had been killed by the mountain lion or the beast. Okay, what does Pharaoh see? He sees the, the joy of, of Jacob, the father of, of Joseph, finding his son is alive. So he gives him the, the name, the one who lives, the one who still lives. Oh, wow. So Zaphoneth so, Paanea means he who is called the one who lives. Now that, that name, Anea, Anea is a name that we have in the ancient Egyptian text for the most important and powerful vizier of the era. He has granaries named after him. He's called Anku. That's the way we pronounce it today in Egyptology, but it's actually Eneoch, okay? But it, we, let's say Anku for argument's sake. You will find him in the literature. He is the most important vizier of the era. He's very powerful, and he has granaries named after him. Well, who has granaries named after him? The right. man who saved Egypt yes. from the famine by building grain granaries, stores yes. for the people during the famine period. Wow. So we actually can identify Joseph in the Egyptian literature. Uh, well, it's funny that you say and you mention this because I've read this name. Uh, there's a text called the Legends of the Jews that explains the story of you talk about you talk about Lewis Ginsburg now yes uh-huh okay yeah yes and and in the story of Joseph it talks about how um, he was stood up by the Holy Spirit because after he had interpreted Pharaoh's dream Pharaoh wanted to appoint him as this busier position to make him second greatest in the kingdom and to yep. appoint him to, you know, take over the administrative work or uh, preparing for the seven years of plenty and the seven lean years that mm -hmm. would follow according to the vision. And so um, in the legends of the Jews, again, it tells the story of how the Holy Spirit came to him because Joseph, in order to prove his worth, he would have to speak to not only Pharaoh, but those that were gathered of his council in the 70 languages of that particular age in that particular time and he was not knowledgeable in all of these different languages but the holy spirit coming upon him overnight he became uh well versed and was able to pass this particular test and then to take on that particular role and then afterwards when pharaoh gives him his ring gives him this gold necklace puts on him this uh, this robe or this dressing, then that name is uh, is mentioned, and of course, um, uh, it's it's in that text in in the story of Joseph. Perhaps it's after you know he meets his father, and uh, it is actually after he meets his father and his brothers, and so it would make sense that Pharaoh witnessing because he was overjoyed at their reunion would appoint him that particular name and that he would become come to be known by that it's a, yeah. again just an incredible confirmation of the story it, that you yeah i mean yeah. one thing i've been criticized for by my colleagues especially ones who are, are, are not uh, in the mood to change egyptian history is that this whole thing that I've put together is too perfect. It's just too good to be true, is the expression they use. Well, I would argue that, hang on a minute, the truth should be good to be true. I mean, you know, if it's right, it's right. It can't yes. be half right or a quarter right. So it's a, it's a nonsense argument to say if we found something as perfect in terms of a match as that, that we should deny it because it's too good a match. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that should be more confirmation uh, of it being factual and the fitting together like that they that's like the bible says out of the mouths of two or three witnesses shall the truth be established and certainly yeah. that seems to be confirming witness to me good well that's excellent unfortunately of course archaeology will never produce every single piece of evidence to support the bible that's not the nature of archaeology i mean as you probably know we, we, we've only really excavated between 10 and 15 percent of what's out there to yes, find right so there's so much more to find over the centuries. And, and you know, a city like Hatzor, for instance, in northern Israel, you know, it took hundreds of years and thousands of people to build. 
and we've got teams of like 20 archaeologists digging for uh, six weeks a year, you're never going to uncover everything, you know, in, in our lifetime and in many other mm -hmm. lifetimes to come. So the, we only have a scrap of evidence at the moment. But when we do focus on something like the Joseph storm, we find so much confirmatory evidence. That's brilliant. When it comes to Moses, we are in much more difficulty because we don't have the same sort of evidence for Moses, unfortunately. Mm. Um, with regard to the books that you've written, uh, which ones are specific to the revelations that you've shared with us uh, with regard well, to Joseph and Sure. Well, the first one I wrote, the Test of Time, Pharaohs and Kings book, uh, was was written back in ninety four. Well, it was written in ninety three and ninety four, but it came out in ninety four. Um, that was really where I first announced to the world this this material. But since then, of course, we've moved on, and there's far more information come to light since then. Since the original thesis was put forward, we've had corroborative evidence, much more corroborative evidence coming along. So my most recent book, uh, which was called uh, Exodus Myth or History really encapsulates all this evidence that's come to light since the publication in 94 of A Test of Time. And of course, we've had the, the movies, the documentary movies, the Patterns of Evidence movies. The first one was called Pattern of Evidence Exodus, which was received in the United States to huge acclaim. And it, was, uh, it won multiple awards. Uh, made by Tim Mahoney of Minnesota. He was the director um, and filmmaker. And they, they produced another one now called uh, Patch Evidence, The Moses Controversy, which deals with whether or not Moses could have written the five books of the Tanakh, the, sorry, of the, of the Torah. So um, we, we have these two major documentary films which have been seen by millions of, millions of people. Yeah, they've been on Netflix. They've gone all around the world now. And, and really, that's where my work has come to light for the American audience. The Test of Time did very, very well in Europe and in the UK, but it didn't do so well in America at the time um, that it came out. So it was quite new to Americans when this material came to the fore in these two movies. And so that's really why you're talking to me, because you would never have heard of me if it wasn't for those two movies. Right, right. And I want to just give a shout out to Jeff Massaro, who was uh, the one that put us in contact with you. And um, yeah, and also, I'm sure he's reached out to you as well. But uh, we thank you, Jeff, and appreciate your interest in our work. And one of the reasons why he did put us in contact with each other is because of a certain prophecy that I'd been working on in one of my books called The Ancient Prophecies of Christ, which is one of my latest. It's the, my 21st book. And right. in, in that book, it makes mention of this 5,500 year prophecy that Christ would, you know, come after Adam is cast forth from paradise. And so you had mentioned that you thought that it went back to 5,500 BC. Um, and so can you kind of relate to us what you have discovered and how it might relate to this prophecy as well? Well, I'll have a go. Um, the first thing is that we, we can't. Uh be specific in my view of exactly mm -hmm. when the Eden, Edenic stories ex were played out in the ancient world. I mean, that's a very hard thing to do. As I say, right. it's pre-writing, so it's very hard to do that. Yeah. But if we look at the anthropological and archaeological evidence, we can be very clear that we have a particular transitional period in, in terms of civilization, humani humanity's civilization. And that is the transition from hunter-gathering societies, which were basically wanderers who would hunt and gather nuts and, and things like that. They weren't established in a single location to something we call sedentary uh, living, which is where people settle down in communities, in villages, and start to plant crops and start to cultivate and start to... Um, adopt animals and to and to to use animals in their farming and for food etc including shepherds for instance pastoralists who would obviously um, be moving their flocks around and that's the story we get of the abrahamic um, uh, line if you like the the line of um, Abel's line of course he was killed by his brother who was the city dweller the, the man who created cities who was the farmer um, and of course we have the conflict between those two farming and, and pastoralism right. uh, which we, we know about in the story of Genesis reflected in those two characters and of course the line of the descent through Seth which is the pastoralist line uh, which becomes Abraham so you have the city dwellers of, of, of Enoch and uh, descended down from Cain 
Cain and you have the pastoralist line coming down uh, to, to Abraham. So you have that perennial conflict between city dwelling life and farming and pastoralist life of moving around the countryside in and out of the of the network of cities that existed in the ancient world which of course is what Abram did when he came down into Canaan uh, and and so, so so forth with the patriarchs so we have that conflict there but we have something at that transitional point between hunter-gatherer society and sedentary society which we call the Neolithic revolution and what the Neolithic revolution is is in the Neolithic age or the late stone age we have this transition uh, where people start to settle down and they start to, to cultivate crops, etc. They, they become viniculturists, they make wine, they make pottery. And because of these things, and then they're living in a community, they have to have a leader, a leader who is the chieftain, if you like, of the, of the settlement. And those chieftains eventually develop as these settlements become villages and from villages become cities. Those cities then have rulers kings who are the ones who control society and those are what we would call the antediluvian kings that we find in the biblical story now they are in fact twofold because there are two forms of kingship in this period we have the priest kings which are called the enses in sumerian and we have the lugals or the which means big man which are the materialistic kings the warrior uh, kings the ones who who control and govern whereas the priest king is responsible for priestly activities the worship of cults and gods etc so we have encapsulated two rulers living in each city now that was completely foreign to the Abrahamic line. They didn't believe in that stuff at all. But that was the conflict we have that we see throughout the stories in Genesis, where Abraham and, and his descendants are mixing in with and filtering through the cultures that they found around them in cities, the Philistine cultures, the the the, the cultures in, in, in the city of Jerusalem, for instance. We have a king in Jerusalem at the time of, of, the, of the patriarchs. And, of course, in the Egyptian state as well, where we have big cities. So there is this, this dichotomy between city-dwelling and pastoralism and the biblical line if you like the line of the patriarchs is the pastoralist line not the city line mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i i um take this division between the the two different bloodlines um that there's very literal uh difference between them the canaanites and also the the children of adam through seth because of abel being murdered and I follow mm -hmm. these two bloodlines and the prophecy of that there will be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, that we see this division and this um, this conflict between them raging even in this day and age. I believe true, that true. the oh. yeah, I believe that the New World Order elites are part of this bloodline and that they have historically all throughout the eras have had the divine right of kings that their bloodlines have seated, uh, been seated upon the thrones of the different cultures and civilizations, and they have been instrumental in guiding history towards uh, what would be really a prophetic and biblical climax um, with the war, uh, the Ezekiel and the Jeremiah wars against the coming of the true Messiah, and that there mm -hmm. will be this false antichrist Messiah that comes before him but um i wanted to also ask you of if in your study and in your research of anything to do with giants and if you've uh. seen and what you know of this because i know this has got to be a taboo subject and it's one that is esoterically driven and one that may not be spoken about by um you know, people that are uh, maybe weary or careful um, when it comes to this particular subject. Okay, well, we're probably going to not fall out exactly, but maybe disagree on this one. Mm. Um, the Nephilim is an interesting story. Um, these mighty men, these these great men of great stature. Um, it's hard to understand that from an archaeological posi position. It's mm -hmm. hard to understand it from a historical position. All the photographs you see on Facebook and elsewhere of these massive skeletons and these human beings, they're all fake. I'm sorry, they are fake. 
um, every single one of them, you never see a different photograph of the same thing from a different angle. You only ever see one photograph of each of these. And so you, in an archaeological situation, if you find a large item or any item that you find in the ground, you photograph it from all angles. You record it properly. What you see here is lots of photoshopped images of ordinary skeletons using the context with uh, smaller figures. You see it all the time on the Internet, and that is my position on them. As far as the Giborim are concerned, the, the mighty men that we find in the biblical story, including Goliath in that particular context, we do know that the Indo-European cultures that we find in the ancient world were of high, bigger stature than the Middle Eastern cultures, the, the Semitic and, and Hamitic peoples. So they, they were in fact larger. But of course, if you look at something like uh, Goliath, for instance, there are two sets of dimensions for him. There's the one in, in the Masoretic text and there's one in the Septuagint and the Septuagint is much more realistic and I tend towards thinking that the Septuagint is more authoritative than the Masoretic in many instances, especially when it comes to details like this. Uh, and we can argue about that, but of course the, the, the Septuagint, you must remember, was written by some of the greatest rabbis of the era in the second century BC and they wrote it for the Greek pharaohs, the Ptolemies, for the Alexandrian Library, and they were great authorities, and it does predate the Masoretic text. So, and the same with the Samaritan text as well. That also seems to agree with more with the Septuagint than it does with the Masoretic. So I tend to follow the Septuagint more than I would the Masoretic in most instances. However, in in the the Goliath story in the Septuagint, his dimensions are still great, but they're not massive. They're not huge. They're not abnormal for a human being. Um, so he was a big man. There's no doubt about that. But he wasn't, you know, like 15, 20 feet tall. Um, and and the same thing with the, these Nephilim. I don't think we have anywhere other than this description that we are like grasshoppers when we compare to these Nephilim. But, I mean, that could be poetical. And I, I think that a lot of the way that history was written in the ancient world, and in specifically in, in the Genesis stories, they weren't what we would call scientific historians like we are today. They don't explain things in a scientific way. They use their faith and their belief in religion to explain phenomena. They, they, they look at the natural world, and when some event occurs in the natural world, they, put, they place it in the responsibility of the gods. Now, that is fine in a, in a Yahwehist uh, situation. Uh, Yahuwah can work with, with nature. He, after all, created nature, and therefore he can work with the tools of nature. The crossing of the sea with Moses is a natural phenomenon which of, of extremity, but it's all about what what God uses, the tools God uses in his miracles. And and so the ancient way of explaining that, and I'm talking about now about outside the Bible in terms of other civilizations and other religions that we have in the ancient world, that they explain all these things through their gods. This is how they do things in the ancient world. And so when it comes to the writings of the ancient world, they're not histories as we would write them today. They're not like my books or like other people's books. They are descriptive they are poetical they're like homeric they have a homeric quality to them so just as you would read homer and the, and the iliad and the odyssey you know there's um these are storytellings these are for a people to be gathered around while homer or one of the poets would sing these wonderful epic stories well the same thing was happened in the ancient world i'm sure moses was a great poet and a great singer we have examples in the bible where he sung you know the miracle, the, the story of the sea the, uh, the, that we mm -hmm. have. The, the that's a song that Moses composed. You know, and and he did so later on as well. And so these people would sit around and listen to these fabulous stories, and of course they would be told in a grandiose, spectacular fashion. So I think there's a certain amount of poetical license we have to have with the Genesis stories. We shouldn't be too literalist with exactly trying to in interpret what the meanings are of things like these great Nephilim people. How big were they? You know, were they 50? feet tall were they 25 feet tall we can't say there's no way for us to know that i don't think well i i do agree with you that as far as the images that are online that there is a lot of photoshop and certainly that we can't accept that as evidence but what i was referencing and what i was asking you about is if any of your colleagues had come upon or discovered like for instance the uh the burial tomb of um uh, the the giant that they found in there in Iraq 
Um, the, oh gosh. I'm not sure if I I am not Gilgamesh. sure if I know about those. Oh yeah, the it Gilgamesh, was Gilgamesh. Right? Yeah, where well they, ha they showed... haven't found they haven't found Gilgamesh's tomb. They haven't found that. In fact, it specifically says in the story, the legends of Gilgamesh, that they dammed the river Euphrates and they uh -huh. built his tomb in the bed of the river. And then once they covered it all over, they, they broke down the dams and, and the river flowed over it again. Um, so we don't have any evidence of Gilgamesh's tomb. Um, we may have evidence of other people. They're certainly not Gilgamesh, as far as we know. Uh, but I would mention one archaeological instance in Tel El Sahadia in the Jordan Valley. They, find a, they found a family of tombs, and not just one, but several of one family, and they were all extremely tall. They were in their sort of seven, eight feet uh, heights, and, mm -hmm. and they were, the skeletal remains were very clear, and that was a proper archaeological dig, and they were large, but they're not large out of proportion to what we know people can be even today um so we have living people who are those those sorts of heights mm -hmm. uh, and 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 interestingly enough the the name gulatu uh, uh, was found in association with peoples in this area and of course that is the name goliath, goliath yes. so we do have the name attested in fact it was for a female we have a female called gulatu but it was the same it probably was the same family line mm -hmm. um, so uh, and we th we believe that he is actually probably a, a Lycian he comes from southwest uh, Anatolia or Turkey so and, and and the people in those areas were big some of the guys who fought in the Trojan War were big mighty people so we know that the Indo-Europeans what we would call uh, our western civilization those people uh, were big, big big characters they were tall they were very muscular just like the Vikings some of the Vikings were very big and strong so uh, when, when the when you look at them from the Levantine perspective when you look at them from the Semitic perspective these guys were big and that's what you hear about when the spies come back from the promised land and, and speak to, to, to Moses they say right. oh these people are big these, these are huge people we can't fight these people they're far too strong for us mm -hmm. yeah I, I agree with you with regard to that but I also think that like for instance here um, when this new world was settled in the United States and the farmers were excavating the land and there were instances and in several hundred that are accounted in some of the uh, old newspapers of the different towns and cities that had come up during the that particular time in the 1700s and 1800s and they make mention of discovering skeletons of what seems to be the mention of a race of giants and that these giants also had the anomalous six-fingered six toes that are mentioned in the Bible as being a characteristic of Goliath and even Og of Bashan. And so I was just, you know, wondering if you had come across any of that uh, in your work. Well, I, all I can say is that the way that an archaeologist and a historian works is they require evidence. Now, if you have a newspaper report from the 1700s, that's pre-photography, okay? So we don't have any photographs. Um, what we should have is the artifactual remains. So what I would ask for in that situation is show me the evidence, show me the archaeological mm -hmm. remains. Also, I would hazard a guess, and this is only a guess from my part, but America is the land of dinosaur bones. And so, you know, people may have dug up stuff that they thought was human, I mean, massive human. It's hard to say. In, in, perhaps in the, in, the, in the sense of the Greek world, um, you know, when they talk about dragons and things like that, you're possibly looking at the fact that people have come across dinosaur bones and they believe them to be the bones of dragons. So I, I would need to see the evidence clearly, and I only work from evidence. So yes, I, I have to that. I have to see the evidence. And so when I when I talked earlier on about the fact that when you see a photograph today on on Facebook or wherever of of a giant skeleton and an excavator's I would ask for a second or third photograph from a different angle of exactly the same thing. That's the sort of evidence I would require. And I've never, ever seen a second photograph of one of these images from a, taken from a different angle. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, um, you know, we can agree to disagree on this particular subject matter. But, you know, my personal take on it is not from the archaeological evidence, as you stated, my research is from the ancient manuscripts and the mythology but I wanted sure. to ask you also what you thought about and if you have read the the book of Enoch 
and the the Genesis 6 story of the sons of God, you know, mating with the daughters of men and creating sure. a race that's men of renown. <clears throat> what do you think about that? those particular? Okay, well, I did read the Book of Enoch way back, <laughs> and it's not right in the front of my memory at the moment yeah. as, to the, as to the exact details of it. Um, I, I I treat it as uh, another ancient text. Uh, I would want to look at the original sources for it, and which I haven't done, of course. Um, so I would think that the, the the whole story of the Nephilim is a mystery to me. I don't know how I can how I can contribute to that discussion because from from my perspective, from a historical perspective, I know I don't have any answers to it. I don't have an explanation for it. I, 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 like anybody in this world, modern world today, have no qualms about saying that there are other beings that exist in our universe. Um, whether or not they visited this planet is another matter. I can't say whether they have or not. I don't think at the moment we have concrete enough evidence to say, but I've got an open mind about it. But I don't want to dis distract from um, the the Bible and Yahuwah by saying mm -hmm. that everything in the ancient world is, was brought to the earth by aliens. I wouldn't want to say that. I right. think humanity, it, it, God gives humanity the skills and the knowledge to do what it achieves. And I, you know, I, it doesn't require ancient aliens to build pyramids. It doesn't require them to to move megalithic stones. I think there are uh, other ways to explain that. And I don't want, I don't want to to turn God into an astronaut. Uh, I I'm in agreement with you fully, and I think that this is something that has to be um, that we have to be very careful with. And in my opinion, I do believe that. Part of the coming strong delusion is the whole premise that uh, God is an ancient alien, and that mm -hmm. you know the coming of the Antichrist, that um, that whole ideology is being pushed forth by, for instance, the Ancient Aliens History Channel show, and a lot of those that have now bought into this ideology. And mm. that it does detract and take away from that, you know, God, the the real God, the God of the Israelites, created us in His image, and that He is the one that established even the entirety of the creation, and the earth sure. is our home. So, exactly. And I was actually in, in asked to by the producer of the Ancient Aliens to appear on that show, and I refused for that very reason. Um, you. you know. The creator of the universe is not an ancient alien. Sorry. Right. Yes, <laughs> it just absolutely. doesn't work that way. Well, that we are in firm agreement uh, Good. together. Good. So, yes. Um, I wanted to also ask you as far as your work, because you have been in the field for a very long time. Um, can you tell us of any strange or anomalous or just kind of weird anything that you've discovered or come across in your work? Well, that's a difficult one. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a realist, okay? Um, you know, I when people talk about seeing apparitions and ghosts and things, I say, well, I've never seen anything in my life like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm a bit straightforward like that. As I said, I'm a dirt archaeologist. I take things on a practical level. What I can say is that it's amazing to me, and, and in, in, in a sense it's faith-fulfilling, that when you start to really examine the biblical stories and the biblical narratives from a historical perspective using archaeology using textual analysis etc it's amazing how many times the bible comes through yes. with shining colors and right. that to me is amazing for instance i'll give you an example uh, and you probably will be a little bit surprised by this but one of the big questions when i was dealing with the exodus story was what about the crossing of the sea um, you know, the miracle of the sea. How can I explain that in terms of archaeology and science and all the rest of it? And it was always a great problem. And as you probably know, there are a lot of uh, people arguing on the internet today that the crossing of the sea took place uh, across to Arabia from Nueva, across the Aqaba Gulf, the Gulf of Aqaba. This very, you know, uh, deep channel of the two sides of uh, Mount Sinai and that the mountain of God is over in Arabia. Uh, uh, so there's a, a place called Jebel el Laws. Well, a lot of people are advocating this theory that's come along. And, of course, when you look at the dimensions of that crossing point from Nueva across to Arabia, from the Sinai Peninsula to the Arabian Peninsula, 
they talk about an underwater saddle which was used for the people to cross when the waters parted well i've actually had um on my cruises when i do my lectures on my cruises i've actually had the captain of one of those major cruise ships do a sonar reading at that very spot in between Nueva and arabia and it is 2600 feet deep Okay, now that is more than the height of the El Burj in Nueva, and it's twice the height of the Empire State Building. So when I look at that and I think of the miracle of the parting of the sea, uh, the so-called Red Sea, it just doesn't make any sense to me. There's nothing that could do that, not even... God uses nature, and nature never does anything like that. So we have to look for something as an alternative. And what I did was I look at the Egyptian text, and I look at the biblical text, and I look as to where the crossing of the sea took place, and it wasn't there. It was on the border of Egypt, and we know that. It was in the area of the Desert of Shore. Now, we know where the Desert of Shore is because Hagar, when she flees from Abraham's tent, she's an Egyptian. She's fleeing back to Egypt. She goes on the way of shore, and it is in actually northern Sinai. It's the flat, sandy desert in northern Sinai, which is what she's heading for. And, and the word shore actually means wall in Hebrew. And there was, in fact, a major frontier barrier, uh, where the, roughly where the Suez Canal is today, which is what the, the desert of shore was named after. It was called by the Egyptians the walls of, of, of Egypt, in other words, the walls of the pharaoh. So it actually was the frontier point. And it's in that area that we have something called the Bala Lake system. And, and they were a very... Um, expansive uh, marsh region, open water region, fresh water region, which, in which grew papyrus and reeds. Now, Yam Suf, which is what the biblical text refers to, means the sea of reeds or, or the, the, the waterway of reeds. Yam in ancient Hebrew doesn't just mean sea. For instance, the Sea of Galilee, which is a large lake, is also called Yam. So is the Dead Sea. They're not expansive seas. They are, they are major lakes. So Yam in this context doesn't have to be a sea. It can be a large expanse of water. Now, what, what happened there was scientists have used um, computer modeling in that region to see what a strong east wind would do in that region to those areas. And the, the scientific results are fantastic because it shows a parting of the waters on two sides at that very location where the waters are pushed back on two sides with a 60 mile an hour wind. Now, a 60 mile an hour wind is something you can stand up in a wall it's, it's far less than what's been happening in America with the hurricanes recently. As you know, they were much, much more strong than that. So a 60 mile an hour wind is, is less than the hurricane one uh, level. So the water's actually parted in that area, and the model shows that they parted at around 8 o'clock at night. 8 to 9 o'clock at night was when the waters receded on both sides, and they came back in a rush around 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, that is exactly as the story describes, as the Israelites crossing through the night, then the Egyptians pursuing in the morning and the water drowning them. The water came back in eight minutes flat. So the modeling shows that the waters crashed back in within eight minutes and would have destroyed an army. So that area is much more likely to be where we're looking for the Sea of Reeds. And it's also where we find the toponyms that are mentioned uh, in, in the biblical story. Um, the, you know, the several places that are mentioned, like Piha Kiroth, I mentioned that means the mouth of the canal well there is a mouth of the canal leading in into that particular uh, region there into in that waterway there we have um, Migdol is located there we have a toponym called Migdol in that very area we have Baal Zephon in that location as well so all the places which are located in that region appear in the Bible tell us that's where the Sea of Reeds was not in the Red Sea we do see also in the the legends of the Jews when it speaks about what we now believe to be the Red Sea, that the word was actually Reed Sea. And so it fits along with what you were discussing. Um, but there's two questions from the chat room. One yeah. is to ask you about if you are knowledgeable on the work of Ron Wyatt and his uh -huh. discovery of the chariot wheels at the bottom of this same location, this Reed Sea. Um, well, this is exactly this is exactly what we've been just talking about. Uh, Rolf, uh, Ron Wyatt was the guy who first pr uh, produced the the theory that the crossing point was between Nueva and and Arabia uh, across the the Gulf of Aqaba, and then he went on to argue that Jebel El Laws was the, the the holy mountain, the mountain of God, or Jebel mm -hmm. Musa. Yes. Now he has a lot of followers. 
uh, well, in fact, he's, he's deceased now, but he has a lot of followers who believe him. And he gave a lot of so-called uh, evidence for chariots at the bottom of the Gulf of Aqaba. All of it is fabricated. I'm sorry to have to say, but all of it is fabricated. The the so-called chariot wheels, uh, which were found, or, or chariot remains that were found in the Gulf of Aqaba, are in fact co table coral. Okay, none of the material. He never brought a single thing to to be examined by any archaeologist. In fact, one wheel, which he claimed to have removed from the sea, which was an eight-spoked wheel, he said he took it to the Cairo Museum to be examined by the, the director of the Cairo Museum. The, the name that he gives to the director of the Cairo Museum never existed. He never was a, the director of the Cairo Museum. He was actually somebody who didn't work at the Cairo Museum. And, and that uh, wheel has conveniently disappeared. The, the so-called pillar that was carved with, um, Egyptian, uh, with text on it, including the name of Solomon and Moses and, and the killing of the Egyptians in the sea, there's not a single photograph of that. There's not a single... Um, piece of archaeological evidence that that pillar ever existed on the on the coast of Arabia it's all fabricated and I'm sorry but when when you have a man who says that while excavating uh, around Golgotha in the in the area of the garden tomb in Jerusalem who says that he saw the Ark of the Covenant in a cave there but nobody else has been able to go into that cave and see it and who said he personally met Jesus twice during that uh, excavation, that Jesus came to him and talked to him, the physical body of Jesus there. I don't believe any of that. I'm sorry, but I don't. Uh, no, that's fine. You know, um, we're all just doing our own research to come to truth and knowledge of different things. Um, another question for you uh, with regard to have you heard about or know about uh, like the discoveries of Brian Forrester with the elongated skulls and what you think of that i met brian at a, a, a an open it was a, it was actually a big uh, conference that was held out in a field in a, in a big tent and he was a very nice person i enjoyed his company very much um the elongated skulls is something that it's not in my area because it's mainly mesoamerica and south america that we're dealing with in, and i'm not an expert in that area at all and there clearly are uh, skulls of that strange shape and we do have the amana uh, statues as well of the elongated heads of the children and Akhenaten himself which are very strange uh, and that we know that in in practice in africa and other places they do bind skulls so we do get um, more recent skulls, modern skulls that are bound and therefore squashed and, and they become elongated but that doesn't explain really entirely the, the situation with these skulls in, in, in the Mesoamerica and South America I have no answer for that um, you can argue they're alien if you want uh, or you can argue there are cultural traits some form of binding that took place to make these people, the priestly cult or whatever they were, different in the way they looked to ordinary human beings. But perhaps that's influenced by aliens anyway. I mean, maybe they wanted to look like that because the aliens look like that. It's hard to say. It's, I'm not an expert at that sort of thing, and I wouldn't profess to be, and I don't think I'd want to be, to be honest, because it's a tricky area, and it, it's dependent on anthropological evidence, bone remains. And, and we, as I said, we have... We have text, we have Mayan text, and we have uh, inscriptions talking about, um, you know, Quetzalcoatl and people like that coming to coming to Mesoamerica. Right. I would I would prefer personally to argue that the blue-eyed, black-eyed, black-haired um, people that came from the east were in fact Phoenicians who came across the Atlantic, and we do have shipwrecks, Carthaginian shipwrecks off the coast of Brazil with, with Carthaginian amphorae inside them so we know that the Phoenicians crossed over to the Americas, there's no doubt about that, and and we have terracotta images that look like they're Romans and we have Roman bricks so it's very possible that in that area uh, there were visitations from the, from the old world to the new world at the time that the so-called Quetzalcoatl incident took place when he arrived in the area so and, and I think the you know, when we call these Mesoamerican pyramids pyramids, they're not really pyramids. They're step temples. They're platform temples with a with a house of the god on the top and a staircase going up. Well, there's no Egyptian pyramid look like that at all. However, there are many 
ziggurats in the ancient world, and especially in Mesopotamia, and the Phoenicians originated from that region, which are exactly that shape, where you have a platform, terrace platform structure with a building on the top, the house of the god on the top, and a staircase going up, just like the ones in Mesoamerica. So I think that the cultural influences that we find in the cultures of Mesoamerica come from the Phoenicians, which is it's actually seeded, if you like, the culture from Mesopotamia originally. Yeah, I think there's a lot of evidence for that, um, um, and there's uh, the individual that wrote the Atlantis book. I uh, forget his name right now for some reason. Uh, um, which one? Oh, there are so many. <laughs> uh, the the one that came out in 1882, and he oh right uh, yeah, talked about it? the destruction of the worlds as well. I don't yeah. know why Donnelly. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Ignatius Donnelly. Ignatius, Ignatius Donnelly, Donnelly. Yes, uh, yeah. he yeah. wrote a book about the the Phoenicians as well, and their transfer of culture and civilization, the people mm -hmm. of the seas, I believe it was. But um, a couple more questions from the chat room. Sure. Um, they wanted to know if you have any idea on not only the construction and the building of the pyramids, but also uh, the different megalithic and cyclopean sites where we see the strange weird you know like stones that have just odd shape coming together right. and being placed and also um sites like Baalbek where you have these massive, massive stones yeah trilithium <laughs> yeah, yeah. stones and you know sure. how well, about that i i honestly thought this one would come up <laughs> i knew it would let's have a go and see what we can think of there are lots of elements to this aren't there um Let's let's start with the strange shapes of stone structures that we find that where they've been cut into not cubes or rectangles, they've been cut into awkward and weird shapes. We don't just find that in, in South America and, and elsewhere on, on the Americas. We also find that in Persia. Uh, in the, Persepolis, for instance, we find it on the Apadana, the, the platform upon which the great palace was built in Persia for the Persian kings. And, and it's very clear from that that what they're doing is they are, they are reflecting Mother Nature. In other words, that, that, let me explain something to you about this. The, the, the way that uh, the ancient mind worked was that they understood that the world was chaotic, that there were chaotic forces in the world, and that it was human activity which tamed that chaos. And that, that through the chaos, you get order. And the Egyptians refer to it as ma'at, and they call chaos isfet. And it was the job of the pharaoh or any ancient king to, to redefine chaos in terms of order. And so you would establish order. Now, they do that for instance, by cutting stone in a very rectangular form to show that this is human activity. But also, they want to hark back to nature and the gods that provide nature. I mean, the, the ancient word for nature, um, we get that word from ancient Egyptian nature, which is the word for god. So, um, yes. you know, we, we, they understood nature as god. Okay, and we would do that as well, wouldn't we? Uh, Yahuwah is nature. <laughs> Yahuwah created nature. Yeah, so uh, th there is no issue there about that. That what what the world is, what the world gives us, what we call nature, is 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 a blessing on us. So when you have monuments that are made in platform shape, they they cut the stones to be more naturalistic. They don't make them into rectangular shapes. They put them more naturalistic to create the effort of making a, a man-made mountain which is what a ziggurat is. A ziggurat is a man-made mountain on which the house of the god rests at the top. And when you look at the Bible, most of the time you find that, that people communicate with God on a mountaintop. That's, where the, that's the meeting place usually. So this is very ancient, this idea that you communicate with God on top of a mountain. Mm -hmm. Now, you could look at that with the pyramids too. You could say, well, maybe that's what pyramids are. Maybe they're artificial mountains. And then you have to argue about, well, hang on, what about the technology of it? Now, this is an area which has been you know, gadding about the internet for donkey's years and before, yeah, the, right. don before the internet. And, and okay, they are remarkable. The stones are remarkable. They're, the people exaggerate the Great Pyramid, for instance. You know, you've got 2.3 million blocks of stone. They're not all huge. They're between two and a half and five tons, most of them. 
well, that's not a difficult block to move around. I mean, you could, you know, a few, a gang of 15, 20 people could probably shift that on a sledge. Not to, you know, especially if you've got um, uh, mud, uh, mud brick ramps and you've got water being poured on them, so you're sliding on a wet surface. You know, you can, you can see that sort of thing possible. When it comes to places like Baalbek, and I've been to Baalbek and I've studied the, the site, um, that's a whole different ball game. Mm-hmm. Now, why do they, why did, who and why and was it humans could cut something as big as that right. and hope to move it why is that massive obelisk sitting in aswan in the and the granite quarries there that one cracked and so they left it behind they couldn't they couldn't actually move it it broke its spine but they were certainly intending to move it and you're not going to say that they were you know aliens they were egyptians and we have plenty of huge obelisks to prove that they did that sort of work you know mm-hmm. so i look at it a different way i look at it that you know the ancients didn't have tv they didn't have the internet. They didn't go to the cinema. They didn't have all the distractions that we have today. We've lost our, we've lost touch with nature. We've lost touch with this world of ours. You know, we don't. We we we've created our own artificial world, this order, and we don't exist within the chaotic world that exists around us. And then the chaotic world comes along and bites us in the backside every so often, and we get really shocked when something terrible happens. And that's nature just reminding us, and God reminding us that you know we're humans, and and we shouldn't pretend to be God. So the the whole idea that you are controlling nature, the controller of nature, the master of animals motif, is all about controlling the wild world, the chaotic world, and, and turning it into civilization. Well, civilization will fall eventually. You know, nature will come back, and God will come back and say, "It's the end of you. We're having no more of you." You know, the, the way that you constructed a world is your idea of how you should be God, and you're not God. That's the Bar- Tower of Babel story all over again. So, mm-hmm. it, it, you know, people in the ancient world, they didn't have much to do. What did they do? They cut stone, they built mud brick buildings, and they moved stone about. That was about as much as they did. Okay, that's basically what civil, ancient civilizations did, especially in Egypt. So they were experts at it because they didn't have much else to do, and time was, of the, it was not of the essence. They could take as long as they liked to do these things. So, you know, you know if, if somebody was cutting a statue of a king, it wouldn't be one person, it'd be a whole team of people, but they would take, you know, whatever long it took to cut that statue, maybe three, four years. They wouldn't rush it. They didn't have to produce it for next week. And so time was not in the same as it is today. They didn't. They weren't concerned with time quite so much as we are today. So I see the building of pyramids um, as something which was... The, as a result of the ego of maniac rulers. I mean, you know, the Great Pyramid is a folly. It's a folly to a, a somebody's ego. Um, it's not a, an ancient source of energy. It's not a, a reservoir for water. It's not a grain store of Joseph. It's none of those things. It is simply the tomb of a pharaoh. However, the configuration of the Giza Plateau with the three pyramids is something quite different to the actual pyramids itself. And the age of the Sphinx is quite different to the pyramids themselves. The pyramids were almost certainly cut in the fourth dynasty, so around 2450 BC. The Sphinx is a lot older. And some of the complex that's there, some of the the tombs, the causeway, the the mortuary temples, what the so-called mortuary and valley temples are much older than the pyramids. That's quite clear from the geology. And so there was something in existence at Giza long before the pyramids. And the pyramids become markers on something that was underground. They mark three locations on that plateau, which match with the Orion Belt, um, which, of course, is the the theory of uh, Beauval, uh, who is a, a good friend of mine. And and uh, and I think that actually makes a lot of sense that it's marking a place, uh, you know, a, a place in time for Septepi, the place when, a time when Septepi existed. That's what it marks. But what is under the pyramids is what was originally marking that, not the pyramids themselves. The pyramids were built on top of those marker points. Yeah, um, I've also seen, I forget which book it was, but Andrew Collins he put out a book talking yeah. about their possible alignment to the star system Cygnus and yeah. that there's a another aspect of these particular uh, temple alignment that points to um, something that was just recently discovered under the uh, ground that um, represents something connected to the feathered serpent or something of that nature. Do you know what I'm speaking about? 
I know Andy, and uh, he's a good author, actually, and a good yeah. researcher. Uh, I haven't looked at this particular Cygnus mystery issue that he's written recently. I haven't had the time to do it. it he could be right. I don't know. But I think that Robert Boval's argument about the Orion Belt is also just as equally yes, uh, likely I to do. be right. Um, and uh, But you've got to understand, I've talked to Robert long and hard about this. It, he's not arguing that the pyramids were built in 10,000 B.C., because of this. He's arguing that they reflect a time period where the architects who built the pyramids look back to, is right. what he's referring to. Okay, right. And it's very clear with uh, Schock's work and other, other work. When Robert Schock's work on the geology of the Sphinx, I don't right. agree with his dating, but I do agree with the erosion patterns being older than the, 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 the pyramids themselves. And it's mm -hmm. quite clear that Fourth Dynasty structures and buildings there are much, much less eroded than earlier material. So it's quite clear that there was something special and sacred at that location before the pyramids were built. Yes, um, I wanted to ask you also your thoughts on when possibly the water levels and if when the oceans may have risen and what you may consider a factor for um, that happening. Right. Well, um, I'm not. I, I know that you've argued of uh, water being in the atmosphere in this crystal dome over the Earth, and uh, I'm not someone who follows that myself. Uh, the flood story itself is is uh, recorded in Sumerian literature and Akkadian literature, um, and of course you have the uh, mention in Gilgamesh also of the flood hero. Uh, so in in that particular case, it's Utnapishtim, but we also have yes. Atrahasis and Ziazudra, who are the other right. two Prodeos. Right. Um, and and in the case of those, the the god who whispers in the ear of Ziazudra is in fact the god Enki, Enki um, yes. or Ea. Ea is the Semitic name for him. Right. Um, and and he is called the friend of man. He's called the uh, Enki means Lord of the Earth. It's actually just an epithet, Enki. It's it's just it's a title if you like. Um, we get much closer to the original name when we look at Ea, which is the Semitic name, the Akkadian name for him. And Ea um, is actually, his name is seen even in the Hittite texts in, in uh, Anatolia, in Hattusa. We, we actually have a representation of the god Ea. Now, when you look at, for instance, at the story of the burning bush episode, uh, we, have this, we have that phrase, Ea Asha Ea, I am who I am. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you look at that and you take off the H's, which are vowel markers, they are something which are added to the text later, you have Ea, Ash, Ea. And, and Ea, in one of those Ea's, the second one, is actually the reference to the god Ea. So Ea, Ash, Ea means I am the one who is called Ea. And so when Moses then says later on, a little bit later in the conversation with God, he says, well, when I go back to Egypt, who shall I say sent me? And God replies, tell them that Ea sent you. I am is how it's translated in the Bible, okay? But it actually is a reference to the God of Noah, the God who warned him of the flood coming, which in ancient Sumerian text is, is this God Enki, which is just a title, all right? So it's a, an epithet. So it's a reference to God acting in Genesis uh, that we find uh, then a play on words when it comes to the Moses story because it's obviously... There's a lot of this in the Bible where you have these play on words where there's double meanings to things. So Ea Asher Ea can mean I am who I am, but it also means I am who, the one who is called Ea. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a reference to Ea from much, much earlier in the, in the prehistoric period, if you like, the, the, the era before writing when Noah was around and the flood took place. Now what the flood was, hard to say. Um, it certainly was a, a big dramatic flood and we do have evidence for one such flood at the city of Ur uh, sorry the city of Uruk um, no sorry the city of Ur I've got it wrong city of Ur where we have where a great pit was dug and they found uh, several meters of silt at the bottom of the pit and below that was civilization and above that was civilization so it was clear that there was a wipeout at one point where there was a massive flood and a huge deposit of silt meters thick now, we've not been able to find that in many other sites, but that was Noah's flood as far as um, uh, the, we, we were concerned in the, in the 1850s, 1890s, when, uh, when it was being excavated. And so there is evidence of massive floods in Mesopotamia. Uh, 
So where did it where did it come from? Well, ice melt is a possibility. Uh, the possibility of the the Zagros Mountain uh, snow coverings that they rapidly melted is possible of raising of sea levels. There's possibility of all sorts of reasons why that flood would have happened, including the the extraordinary amount of rain that that fell on the, on the land at that time. So, but you have to remember something else, and I, I, maybe you'll disagree with this as well. But when you when you analyze the biblical text and you look at the Hebrew, you have to look at alternative ways of translating words. Mm -hmm. Now, for instance, when it talks about the waters covering the mountaintops, okay, and it says so many cubits above the peak, the highest mountaintop. Well, cubits, as you know, are just the length of the distance from your elbow to your, the end of your fingers. Uh, that's basically what a cubit is, and it's something like I don't know, 15 feet. I think it's 15 cubits or something. That it, it's above the above the the, the highest mountain tops. Well, the word that's used in the Bible for mountain tops is the word har. Okay. Now that's the same word that we use for har megedon or armageddon, mm. which is the name of the hill of Megiddo. Yeah. So it means three things. It means mountain. It means hill, and it also means city mound. Because Har Megiddon is the city mound, Megiddo is a city mound. So when it talks about the flood going 15 cubits higher than the highest city mound, it gives you a different perspective on what this flood was. Okay, and it all dip and and why would you say 15 cubits above Mount Everest, for instance, or 15 cubits above any ma high mountain? You wouldn't talk in terms of 15 cubits. You talk about something much more grandiose. Why literally 15 cubits? But if it was a city mound that was being covered, you would then have an observation of that possibility. Now, who observed it? Who survived that flood? Well, the people in the ark. So they're the ones making the record. They are not over in the Himalayas, they are not in the European Alps, they're not in the Rockies, they're in Mesopotamia with their, with their, with their ark. So they're witnessing what's happening in Mesopotamia, not elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, with regard to Noah's ark, any ideas on if there's been discovery of it, or what's your take on uh, yeah. this sort of That's an interesting one, because uh, I don't think that it's Mount Ararat. Uh, in Turkey, eastern Turkey, I think that's a complete uh, red herring. The pre, the early Christians, uh, the the Syrian Christians, and the um, even the Yazidis and people like that, they all worshipped on a different mountain called uh, Jebel. Um, what's it called now? Uh, my brain's gone a second. Oh yeah, Judi Dag is the name, which is the mountain of the heights. Now that is north of Mosul in the. In the the first range of Zagros Mountains that you get in North Syria there and in the area around Mosul, which has sort of been the area of the Kurds for many, many centuries. And in that area there, they, they go up to this mountain called Judy Dag uh, every year, annually. And on the day that Moses sacrificed, uh, when the, the ark landed, uh, they believe on that mountain, they sacrifice sheep. And, they do, and they've done it for thousands of years. Um, They've gone up that mountain every year to do that. And uh, when you look at satellite photographs of it, there is a, a ruined monastery up there called the Cloister of the Ark, okay, which was built up there on the top of this mountain. And within 200 meters of that, there is a shape in the ground where the local women who've come up the mountain have been digging for bitumen. Now, they use it, to, they put it around their necks as talismans. They have this bitumen, they, they get fragments of it, and they put them on chains and they wear them around their necks. And they claim they come from Noah's Ark, because as you know, it was coated in pitch. Now, pitch is bitumen. You do not find bitumen on top of a mountain. You only find it in the lowlands, because it comes from oil. And you don't you don't drill for oil on top of mountains. You dr drill down in the lowland areas. Okay, so they've they've been digging this shape following the, the curvature of a structure that's been buried in the ground there and they've been digging out all this bitumen coating on this mm. structure and the shape of that is the shape of a boat a ship with two pointed ends and you can go on Google Earth and you can find it it's up there, you can actually see it on Google Earth you can see the pits where they've been digging all around the shape of this boat and so you have this earlier tradition the, the Mount um, 
the the one the um, Mount Ararat story comes from Marco Polo's era when he travelled past that and he asked the people where do you think Noah's Ark landed and the, the locals pointed to Mount Ararat which is called, of course is called Mount Aragat not Mount Ararat and remember in the Bible it talks about the mountains of Aragat not the mountain of Ararat in other words it's referring to a mountain range not one single mm -hmm. mountain mm -hmm. uh, and interesting uh, there's two things since we're getting near the end of the show uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you first your take on and your research into if you have examined the Ark of the Covenant and what you think of where it may be well that's a fairly straightforward one um, the Ark of the Covenant disappears from history as you know fairly early on in the Bible I mean right. it's uh, it's not long not that long after Solomon where we don't hear much of it again until you get to the um, the two extra biblical um, uh, chapters or, or sections, which are not included in the King James version of the Bible. They are included in the Catholic Bible, of course, and that's Maccabees, one mm -hmm. and two Maccabees. Now they are interesting books, and they relate the story of the Maccabean kings, of course, but they refer to Jeremiah. Yes, and and they refer to Jeremiah removing the right. ark from the temple when Nebuchadnezzar is charging down from the north and is about to take Jerusalem and sack it and destroy yes. the whole place. And it says that he, they, that the ark was taken across the Jordan into the area of Mount Nebo where Moses um, looked across the Jordan to the Promised Land and where he was buried in a cave and it says that the ark was placed in the cave where Moses was buried and that no one knows anymore where that place is and it and then it goes on to say that if um, if anybody were to find it the, the the moment that that was found would herald end days and that would be the beginning of the end mm. Now, That's whether you accept that story or not, it's entirely up to you. But mm -hmm. that is a, a, a biblical passage which references Jeremiah, and it's the only one we have because we have no other passage which tells us what happened to the ark other than that one. Right. There are other extra-biblical uh, books that also speak about Jeremiah removing and taking outside of the gate. Uh, one such story that God instructed them to take possibly to this cave where Moses was and that the earth opened up and swallowed it. Um, yeah. And then I wanted to ask you really quickly as well, the if you know of or believe in anything with regard to the story of the Kebra Nagast and that the original Ark of the Covenant was taken by Solomon's son Menlech back yeah. to Ethiopia and that he then replaced it because... Um, the you know the ark was taken um, by Menelik there. Well, it's an interesting story, and uh, it's certainly believed by the Ethiopians. Um, right. and, and Graham Hancock, of course, went in search of that particular ark mm -hmm. in the little shrine there. But um, my my view is that there were probably many arks made. Uh, the the original one uh, may have been the one that was taken away, or maybe one of the copies was taken away. Mm -hmm. um, I see no reason why some story like that couldn't have a basis in history. Um, certainly, I think the Queen of Sheba is a historical character uh, coming from Yemen and that area. So um, I, I have a, a so an interest in it, but I can't say for certain. I don't think the Ark that is in Ethiopia today is the original. I don't mm -hmm. think that's the case. Um, um, so. You know, the, the mystery of the Ark is fascinating. It certainly didn't end up in Tannis, as you would have in the Indiana Jones movie, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't it, it doesn't lie in a secret depository in America anymore, or a military <laughs> depository. So, uh, but, um, it, you know, there are many interesting stories, and it's a fascinating aspect of biblical, extra-biblical history, I would say. And and the purpose of the Ark is fascinating as well. So there are, there are, there are interesting aspects to it, but I wouldn't be able to say anything authoritative on it. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, even with the story of the Kebra Nagas, the glory of kings, uh, certainly it gives us an interesting parallel and something to examine. But, you know, even the the priests there, they won't allow anybody to enter or to oh, give confirma exactly. uh, confirmation yeah. as to all that. Um, well, with the last 15 minutes, I wanted to ask you specifically about your take on prophecy and if you...
do look at examine prophecy and what you thought of the times that we are living in now that's an interesting question um prophecy is a difficult subject area because uh, prophetic um what's the word i'm looking for prophetic announcements pronouncements can often be argued by historians to be post prophetic in other words that they they are written post event um, now that's not always the case but it's the case in many examples where you could say or an archaeologist historian would argue that they are post written and you get you know you get things claimed today about people saying that the 9/11 event was prophesied by x y and z but you won't you don't have any pre 9/11 event uh, documents to prove that the only post 9-11 there is an interesting character you probably are aware of called Malachi or Maliki he was um, an Irish um, prophet yes. uh, prophet prophesier mm -hmm. he was actually appointed by the uh, Vatican to go to Rome and to right. write a prophecy of the of the popes and yes. the prediction of the popes I don't know if you know that story yes I do anyway and he and he and and we know that the earliest documentation <clears throat> that we can go back to is 11th century, but it's but the the earliest documentation is 15th or 16th century. So it's not actually of his time. But even that is good. 15th, 16th century. Somebody's predicting something 400 right. years later. That's right. pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> and when you look at this story, um, it's fascinating because he does give us the exact number of popes before the last pope, before the Antichrist yes. appears, and we're at that pope now. We are then the, right. the Pope that we're talking about now is the one <clears throat> that is mentioned uh, in Malachi. And when you look at the names or the epithets given to each of the popes in the series that Malachi gives, for instance, uh, John Paul II is called the, 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 the I think it was called the, the something of the sun, the man of the sun. Right. Uh, and of course, he was born on a solar eclipse and he died on a right. solar eclipse. So yes. that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, pope Benedict <clears throat> um, Ratzinger. Um, there was no Benedictine monk when they elected Pope uh, uh, Ratzinger, and and uh, everybody was had a sigh of relief because the last Benedictine monk was the was the British uh, Archbishop, uh, Cardinal rather, and he died just before the enclave set to, to set the next Pope, and um, and the, the prediction of Malachi was that the next Pope would be the man of the olive. Now the man of the olive, the olive is the symbol of Benedict, and the order, the Benedictine order. So what does Ratzinger do? He calls himself Benedict the Sixteenth. Mm -hmm fulfilling prophecy now did right. he do that on purpose you know he was well aware of that he's an educated man did he do that on purpose uh, so we, we are and the one who followed benedict is the one we have now and that is the last one in malachi's line of popes there are no more popes after this one according right. to malachi so right. now there's an interesting prophecy there is an interesting document which comes several hundred years before now so it's not post prophecy so you could argue that there's something special going on there, and you can then reflect back to biblical prophecy, and you could argue the same thing about big biblical prophecy too. There are events that are still to happen, maybe. I mean, you can you can look at the stories um, about the Antichrist, and you can you can label them as Nero if you wish to, and say that Nero was the Antichrist, or you can look at today, and you can look at what's happening today. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, and uh, and I don't want to get political, but. You know, there is somebody in America at the moment who matches the bill perfectly. Mm -hmm. Well, I do agree with you that the prophecy of the popes is uh, very fascinating and one that um, goes back, you know, again, as you said, 11th, 12th century or whenever it, it was published, but certainly precedes um, the modern era and laid out the, you know, in detail all of these and which have been fulfilled the names mm. of these different popes and the comings yeah. of them. And so, yeah, that's a, a most fascinating. Uh, Tom Horn did a really good uh, study on that in his book, Petrus Romanus. I uh -huh. also wrote about this in one of the books that I released as well, talking about this prophecy. But um, do you think that the, because I take, there's a passage in Matthew 24, Mark mm -hmm. 13 and Luke 21 where, Christ said, beware, uh, um, know ye the parable of the fig tree. And many people interpret that, that the fig tree has connection to the reestablishment of Israel. Uh, so I wanted uh -huh. to ask you about your thoughts on that, and if you thought that, you know, there was some truth to it. Um, 
we're into modern politics now, uh, Israeli politics, and it's a difficult one, really, because I have great friends uh, in the Arab world, and I have great friends in, in Israel as well, yes. and I, tr I do respect greatly the, the state of Israel uh, and the people of Israel. Um, what happens in that area is a difficult one. Jerusalem is a major, major problem, as we right. know. It's called the city of peace, but it's never been the city of right. peace so far. It's always been a city of conflict. What Cut I would trembling. say, yeah. yes, exactly. What I would say is that there is something archaeologically very interesting uh, on the Temple Mount, which might help us to understand how things might be resolved in this world of ours, uh, the Jerusalem world of ours. And that is the fact that um, the, the, the Temple of Solomon and the Temple of Herod were not built where the Dome of the Rock is today. Um, right. it's, ju it's just nonsense, that. I mean, if you look at the Dome of the Rock, you couldn't build a temple on that rocky outcrop there. Mm -hmm. uh, what you have slightly to the north of the Dome of the Rock is a flat area on the Temple Mount, and there is a small dome with eight columns called the Dome of the Tablets, which covers a open surface of the platform of the Temple Mount area, which is the threshing floor that, that was purchased in order yes. to build the Temple of Solomon yeah. on it. And it marks the spot where the Ark of the Covenant sat underneath that dome, re replaces where the Holy of Holies was in the Temple. Now, if you then project due east from that Holy of Holies, that, that spot where that dome is, due east, you come just to the south of the Golden Gate. Now, the Golden Gate is obviously not biblical, it's later. But uh, there was a person who was in that area on, on occasion when it had been raining heavily, and he slipped down in the Muslim cemetery outside the Golden Gate into a hollow where he found a whole pile of bones. And underneath there, just to the, north, to, just to the south of the Golden Gate, was this, another gate below it, which is the Solomonic Gate. And that one is exactly due east of the Holy of Holies under that dome of the tablets. Now, you project from there linking in a direct line east from the Holy of Holies to that, go to that gate of the eastern gate of the temple, which was due east of the temple, and you go across the Kidron Valley and, and you go to the, uh, the Mount of Olives on the other side, you come to the famous Dome of the Ascension. Now, the Dome of the Ascension is where Jesus ascended to heaven mm -hmm. on the Mount of Olives, right? right? And it is the route that Jesus came from Bethany down to the temple on Palm Sunday. It is the same route. It goes past that spot. The road came down there. And then there is, in fact, a, a Gethsemane, a, an olive garden up there as well. The one that we go to conventionally down in the bottom of the Kidron Valley is too low to be anything to do with Jesus and, and, and Gethsemane. And so if you project that line across, you come to the road from Bethany. Now, in Roman law, there are two laws regarding crucifixion and execution. One is that you must execute the perpetrator of the crime at the place of the crime or you must execute him at the place of the arrest okay hmm. now the crime of jesus in roman law was to be proclaimed by his followers to be the messiah as he entered jerusalem on the bethany road coming down the mount of olives and the place where he was arrested was on the mount of olives in the garden of gethsemane so if you're looking for the place where the crucifixion took place it's on the mount of olives and it's not in the Holy Sepulchre, and it's not in the Garden too. Mm, now, if you have the temple built, not you do not have to destroy the Golden Dome of the Dome of the Rock, and you don't have to destroy Al-Aqsa Mosque. All you do is build it, build it to the north, the third temple. You rebuild it to the north of the Dome of the Rock, and you put a dividing wall separating the Muslim half from the Christian Judaic half, and then you have a solution to the Jerusalem problem. You do not have to destroy the Muslim shrines in order to build the, the third temple. And that may be a solution to the, the, the conundrum the, the, of, that we have of the conflict between the three great religions of that region. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be interesting because that would be a resolution. And according to prophecy that, you know, the Antichrist uh, would bring forth a, a peace resolution and that might be one way to uh, placate um, all sides. Um, but in finale, I want to give you a chance, if you would, sir, to just give out as far as where people can go to find your books and your work again right. and to support you if you have any new documentaries or anything of that nature coming out and where people might can go to find and watch those kind of things. 
Sure. Well, the first thing, of course, is everybody goes to the same thing, which is go Google me. And you'll mm. find lots of material on Google, pro and against. You'll have lots of stuff against and lots of tough pro as well. Uh, my books you can get uh, from Amazon. Uh, some of them are still in print, although some of them you would have to get the paperback version. You can sometimes get second-hand versions of those books. Uh, if you want to get my, my latest book, the one that came out a couple of years ago, which is Exodus, Myth or History, which deals with the whole Joseph and, and Moses thing, then you can get that from Amazon. But you can also get that from the Patterns of Evidence web store. If you go there, to patterns of evidence and you you look on the web store you'll find all of my publications my videos my lectures are on dvd etc uh, and they have books there so that's another good resource to go there and have a look and really it's all about you, you know following uh, the the movies that are coming out with the patterns of evidence series there's another one due to come out sometime probably at the end of the year or maybe next year which is on the crossing of the of the sea uh, the miracle of the sea so that will deal with all the stuff we've been talking about it will deal past part with um, the Jebel al Law's theory of Arabian uh, Mountain of Moses. So all that stuff's there. There's plenty to see. And, uh, and, the, and you'll find quite a bit on YouTube too. So there'll be lots of excerpts of various lectures on YouTube. So there's plenty to look at. Most excellent. Do you uh, have anything, a uh, YouTube channel that you regularly broadcast from? Or are you a guest on certain podcasts? Or I know you yeah. said that you yeah. do a lecture series. So can you also provide that information and where people might can go to see you in speaking in person? Right. Well, I, my lecture series that I do here in Spain, you'd have to travel a long way to get there. But I quite often come over to the States to give lectures. And, and you can get the, DVD, the double DVD that's available at Patterns of Evidence uh, in their web store, which has four of my lectures on. And they're basically about this material. You can really absorb it there and take your time to understand it all. So uh, I get about, I lecture all over the place. And sometimes I get to the States. You just have to keep your eye out for Facebook and uh, see when they're announced. Mm, most excellent. Um, well, one final question, and then if you yeah. would, one final comment for you. We've got six yeah. minutes remaining. Just wanted to ask you if what, if there's anything that you are currently working on, um, production of a new book or production of a new movie, what yeah. that topic might be. Right. Well, I've done all the filming for the Pattern of Evidence movies to come in the near, near future. But my book writing at the moment is I'm dealing with the period from the judges period after the, after the conquest of the Promised Land all the way through to the sack of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm focusing on amazing new discoveries that we have relating to King Saul and also to King Solomon. We've actually now been able to identify... Uh, Pharaoh's daughter who married Solomon we now know who mm. she is and which Pharaoh was her father and it's very exciting stuff oh wow very interesting uh, a name for her uh, unless you don't uh, well, want to reveal that yet well I, I will tell you this she has a Semitic name oh fascinating an, e an Egyptian Pharaoh gave his eldest daughter a Semitic name mm, very interesting well, again, thank you, sir, for coming on and joining us and your willingness uh, to share your story. It's an incredible testimony. And as I said, you are, you know, the modern day Indiana Jones. And I'm sure that people listening to your testimony and hearing this particular archive, they wish that they could have lived the life that you have been so blessed to do so. And so final comment from you. Well, it's been an interesting life, and as always, I'm an open-minded scholar. Um, I like to see facts, and, and I like to talk about it with people, and I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. It's been a great pleasure. Well, thank you, and uh, we appreciate you as well, and perhaps after uh, you do come out with this series of patterns of evidence and we get a chance to check it out, then we could have you on again to speak about your, the release of your new work. That would be great. All right. Well, thank you, brother, and thank everybody for listening in. We appreciate all of you, and um, until next time, God bless all. Thank you, David. My pleasure. You take care. You too. See you soon. Be blessed. Shalom. Bye.